I want bad news to be behind a megaphone, honestly, internally. And that's an old Bill Gates thing when he was seen as like a tyrant. He was like, I don't want to hear good news. I want to hear bad news because it makes us better. So I've got to have the types of systems and incentives and motivations where that's not demoralizing, but it actually helps our team realize like, gosh, we're helping so many people and there's still a lot of low hanging fruit to really supercharge uh, sale point. All right, let me, let me put you on the spot here and I don't want you to name Please. and shame anything, but <laughs> what is the most critical or negative feedback that you've seen? Mm. Does that have to be current job or can it be prior? Uh, sure. <laughs> Whichever one you want to go with, but like, what's the what's the like? Ooh, that really cut me to the core, and that hurt me. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. I'm gonna give you two. This is identity at the center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff, and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Not so bad yourself? Good. Is it okay to break down the fourth wall you a little may. bit? We have, right. uh, we have walls in this room, but feel free to okay. kick any down. This thing. Yeah. First off, if you're not watching it on YouTube, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But it <laughs> and is you're going to sound totally crazy here in a second. It's called a dead cat, it right? It is, yeah. And so the idea is that as we take turns asking questions, so we don't talk over each other, mm-hmm. so we're going to pass the dead cat back and forth. Right. It's a very high-tech way to do that. Normally, it's for uh, muffling wind noise and stuff like that on microphones, but there's no wind in the conference room. So no wind here. News. So yeah, you'll see that going back and forth as a little Easter egg for people who are watching on YouTube. Uh, we are at SailPoint Navigate 2024. We're here in Orlando. Orlando, Florida. Yeah. So what do you think? I think it's great. I mean, this conference center, I think, is fantastic. I think we heard the conference won't be here next year, so enjoy your time in Orlando, Jeff. I know you only come here when you have to. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a fan of the heat and humidity, so um, I'll be happy to go somewhere else. But I think we're back in Austin. Yeah. Actually, which is where it's been for the last year. Yeah, weeks. there's no humidity in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, look, I'm an indoor cat. As long as there's air conditioning, you know, Wi-Fi, I'm a happy person. That's all it takes for me. Absolutely. So definitely thanks to SailPoint and RSM for bringing us out here. So they've been kind enough to set us aside some space, get us some great guests for this week where we have a couple episodes and we're going to get to our guests uh, here in a second on RSM for funding our travel. And we're a sponsor here as well. So you'll see us. If you haven't seen us, we're out at the booths as well. And Jeff, I think and, everyone uh, should yeah, notice we're wearing our, our RSM shirts. swag, right? Stuff like that. So um, and then what's next for us? We've got a Gartner conference that's coming up. So we're going to be on stage doing something with our friend Becky. So we'll yeah, we also have a conference uh, discount code, $375 off the registration fee, IDAC375. You can go to Gartner.com to register for that one, or we'll have the link in the show notes. Yep. So people can check that out. It's also on our website, IDACpodcast.com. If you just scroll down, all of our current conference discounts are, are listed there for easy reference. So... All right, why don't we get into it? Because we're really going to kind of focus on IGA and specifically, I think, probably SailPoint here today, just given where we're at for the conference and kind of learn more about their viewpoints on the way they approach identity and specifically uh, identity governance and some of the lanes that they are that they are in and maybe some of the widening lanes that are coming as part of that. So I want to introduce our guest today. His name is Andrew Moore. He's the Vice President of Product Management with SailPoint. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Well, thanks for taking the time. You're a very busy guy, and I want to make sure we get us going and into it. But it's first time with us. We always like to find out uh, identity origin stories. How did you get yeah. into this space? Yours is a little bit different than from, from people, but tell us, how did you get into identity? Yeah. Is it something that you chose, or did it choose you? Oh, identity chose me. <laughs> um, I really love this question. I think when I came into this space, when I joined SailPoint, I'd get it really often, and it, it caused me... One, to be a little bit of surprise, like, is it that odd? But then I thought about how I got here and what it looks like from the outside. So I spent the majority of my time in my professional career in product management, but in big B2C consumer applications. So for those familiar with the MyFitnessPal nutrition tracking application or Expedia and their travel space, I've spent time in like mass consumer applications. So you may be asking yourself, How did identity come into the picture, which you are asking very directly here. Mm -hmm. In my last role before I came to SailPoint, I've been here about four years, and I was hired to come come and build out the platform, the SaaS platform, and really scale it. And the interest from SailPoint was, hey, 
there's a lot of enterprise applications that just need consumer level expectations now. We're all accustomed to experiencing our iPhones and consumer apps. Can we make it easier, less painful? Also, the scale of what's happening in identity is, is massive. And what I did, I, I actually was running the global identity platform for Under Armour. So for those that are familiar with Under Armour, it's a big sp sports and fitness brand. And I worked on the technology side there. Uh, I mentioned the application MyFitnessPal was owned by Under Armour at the time. And throughout time, I was made responsible for building out a centralized data platform, for running our AI, for coaching, like health coaching on top of that. As part of that, I ended up owning the strategy for our homegrown identity system. So if you think about a lot of our customers today at SailPoint out there that had their own either consumer or you know, workforce identity platform, we had built our own for over 200 million identities. And we were given the charge to make it work for not just the application side, but for Under Armour's retail facilities, their e-commerce applications. So we had the single view of the customer. And it was really hard. What I found was to build it in-house, I kept thinking, this has got to be undifferentiated heavy lifting. There's got to be other companies out there doing this at scale, uh, which is where SailPoint came into the picture. I was asking myself, I think I, I, I'm seeing the evolution of what's happening with automation and cybersecurity. It seemed like a good space to go into. And I'm um, from, you know, I live in Austin, Texas. It's where SailPoint is headquartered. I had some connections there and uh, rest is history. Been here about four years and it's been great. So take me through a day of life. You know, I, I mentioned vice president of product management. What yeah. the heck does that mean? Like, what is it you do? <laughs> yeah, so I've got a, a broad purview that my teams are responsible for. And uh, I think about it mostly as from end to end ideation to execution and understanding the delivery of products. So a little bit more color on that. Um, easiest thing that people are can grasp onto if you think about product, it's you develop a roadmap. How do you develop a roadmap? Well, I've got a product analytics team that we're looking at what's happening in our customer base today. Let's analyze how they're using the product. How do we make it easier? got product managers that are talking to customers that are researching the market landscape and building out the strategy for that roadmap. And I've got a design team that ultimately after we decide where we should invest, we've got a researcher team and design team that is designing the user experiencing, the user interfaces, and then a product operations team that's responsible for launching that and going into marketing. So that's kind of in the abstract, what is my org? For me, I spend a lot of time with customers. Um, you know, tomorrow I think I have Obviously, it's our, our conference navigate, but I have maybe 15 direct customer conversations, just meetings with their leadership and their partners and development teams to just understand where are you excelling? Where are we adding value? Where are you hitting stumbling blocks that we need to solve? And um, I just constantly think about these engagements as I'm kind of like chief curiosity guy in our organization need to be curious about what our customers need, what's happening in the market, and how we deliver scalable solutions for them. And it's a, it's a really fun job. It can be incredibly challenging, but um, it's something that I feed off of. It's really fun. So it's a little bit of an interesting background to go from Under Armour yeah. <laughs> right, and other firms. Now you're with an identity company. Mm -hmm. One of the things that as I was stalking you on LinkedIn was the things you mentioned <laughs> that you worked on was uh, this hover connected um, running shoe, essentially, yeah. right? Take me through the process of, because that was several years ago, I think now at this point. Yeah, it's probably almost 10 years, maybe eight years, something like that. So it really would have been on the forefront sort of, the, of, yeah. of that era of wearables and connected health and fitness. And now everybody's wearing a watch or a ring or something, right? Yeah. Uh, but the, at the time, that was a, a, a new thing. Yeah. Talk me through how that product sort of came to life. Yeah. And then here's my follow-up question is, now we're 10 years later, and now you're with a company like SailPoint, and you're doing officially identity things, even though you were doing it with Under Armour. Yeah. What would you have done differently from an identity perspective with that shoe or other yeah. parts of that, of that product line? Mm, such a good question. Um, so how did that product come to life? You know, we, Under Armour made some acquisitions into the health, fitness, health technology space, and honestly, it was they had good foresight. They were getting... You know, there was heavy competition from Nike with their app ecosystem. Fitbit was really growing. It was prior to Fitbit being bought by Google. And they rolled up these three big fitness applications. And we started looking at 
back to just the analytics of the community, what are, where is this, there an intersection between what people pursuing longevity in life and getting healthier need and what Under Armour is uniquely qualified to offer? Um, and Under Armour was looking at going deeper in their running line. They had found kind of a, a strong niche there and really dedicated high performance runners. Um, we had a, an application in Map My Run that was bringing kind of newer runners into the ecosystem. It was one of the largest running apps in, in, in the US. So it was just this good marriage, at least in concept of, all right, we're, we got this footwear expertise, we understand athletes, and we have this community that are interested in this. And so we had this innovation lab that I was a part of, and we started working on, could we create a wearable and embed it in the shoe? Well, then you wouldn't, you'd have to, you have to charge these things, right? What if we used really low energy battery watches that you embed in the sole so it could last longer than the, the actual sole of your shoe? So you'd be getting rid of your shoe anyway by the time it lasted. Uh, all these little things started coming together. Um, and what Under Armour was all about, and this ties back to really my methodologies today in product and how we at SailPoint think about identity is how do we leverage insightful data and collect it in a way that we can solve new problems for people to be informed with data collection. Um, and so we were looking at how runners were, what they were doing before they stopped. If they logged things like injuries that were happening. And if we leveraged this wearable tech in the shoe, we could start to predict when people were getting injured. We could see their cadence and sort of fatigue metrics and figure out how we could coach them to run more effectively. Uh, and so it just it ended up being this really popular shoe line. It was, uh, I think, one of the largest shoe lines by the time I left there. It started with like a cohort of, we did a test experiment of about 10,000 shoes. And by the time I left, we were doing about 5 million, I think, in those shoes, which is really cool. And it was a proud moment in, in my time there. So why identity? You know, and what now, 10 years later, do I think I would have done differently? We did not invest heavily enough in creating a really sharp opinion of the data model and centralizing data to train our coaching algorithms off of. And what I mean by that is like we, you know, we would use anybody's phone, right, to collect data about uh, where they're running, how fast they're running until they got our shoes. And then we got much more accurate data about how they're running. And we just didn't have a the expertise when we first started to build that out efficiently and have a dedicated team on it. We ultimately got there. We invested in a platform team. We brought in kind of, you know, high flying new tech parts of the stack to help us think through this and got some really smart data science folks to do it. I think we did that on the later end when there was a lot more competition in the space. So if I look back on it, I think what I would have recognized is we spent more time on the front end of maybe how do you make it easy to get the shoes connected because Bluetooth is everyone's favorite thing to try and deal with. And we should have spent more time on, can we make sure those insights and the very next action that is best for a runner uh, to prevent injury, to get better, to get stronger made sense. And why I think that's so critical is now I look at where we are and we're in this just massive proliferation of data in the identity space. And we've, we've gone down this very similar journey. And the nice thing for me is I've got the scar tissue to look back on and be like, oh, I've been, I've been in this trench before and it's been really useful now to help me in the current spot. That balance of design and usability is yeah. constantly a struggle in the security space yeah. because it's not historically been a very user-friendly industry right and i mean by that is it's very information dense it is numbers and signals and frameworks yep and trying to put that in front of a normal person <laughs> not an yeah. identity yeah, person yeah. is really an art and a balance right from that, yeah. that design perspective it, it, am i thinking about this in a way that makes sense how does that sort of impact the way that you approach product design for SailPoint, for example is is how, how do you know like what color to use where does this button yeah. go? What should you take away because nobody are using it? Or what are things you want to add in sort of that conversation maybe you're having with clients or customers as well? Yeah, it's a great question. I, you know, commonly I'll say methodologies over genius, you know, right? Like 
The beautiful thing about software, and I will com commonly say that I believe software is the closest thing to black magic that we have to offer, which is why I like to work in it, but we've got just a really sharp group of UX, user experience researchers and teammates. And the methodologies and how they think are, all right, what can we really ask why to the depth that we know the problem they're trying to solve, not predicating a solution? How can we get really low risk signal about how to invest? So we build prototypes. We do paper prototypes that we'll show our customers. We'll do mock-ups that we get interactions for before we ever start writing code so we can learn early. And on the back end of that, it's closed feedback loops. So can you run tests on colors and see who achieves the task faster? Can you, uh, you know, watch the funnel on where people are dropping off and getting struggles? I got some great feedback just walking around on just a string of text in our app that is confusing people. And one customer said it and three other people were like, yeah, that's the worst. And I was like, this is so, this is great. It's great feedback. That's what so, you want to hear, right? Is exactly. How do we improve, right? Exactly. It's so valuable. So for us, that methodology of thinking about the risk and really understanding the jobs that people are trying to accomplish is so important. That's why I love being here, like just surrounded by people that are living this, breathing it of, hey, What's preventing you from getting the value for your organization? What's like driving your team nuts? And there's always these new insights. And so I've got both of the UX leaders here. Um, I probably have like 15 members of my product team that are just constantly, they've got like public Calendly links for people to connect with them here. And uh, a lot of it is being close to the customer and then having those methodologies to, to just refine and create those feedback loops. So Andrew, this is not a, uh, product management podcast, but I'm so fascinated by this topic. There is a podcast I listen to a lot. It's called Lenny's Podcast. Hmm. It's focused on product management. They have folks who are product manage lead product management for companies, you know, like a say a Notion or a Lucid yeah, yeah. Chart, all the way up to people who do product management or lead product management in big tech. Yeah, and so I'm kind of wondering, like, when I think about SailPoint. It's probably the the big giant in the space of IGA, and at the same time, you know, being the big giant, it, you have the the focus and the message out there. We're innovative, so I'm wondering how you make, you know, they used to say with IBM, how or I think somebody wrote a book, how to make the elephant dance. So <laughs> I, I'm wondering, I like, love, how you I do love that. that? Then my follow up question. I'll get them all my product co management questions yeah, out. Do it. The Fair second one is how are product managers evaluated, right? Because you sure. aren't just the only product manager. You have a team of product managers. Yeah, yeah. So how do you know if somebody's doing a good job or not? Great questions. All right. So first, elephant dance. I, I love that, by the way. I'm going to repurpose the elephant dancing. Maybe that's your new error message. You know, it's uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, trying animated to make the elephant dance. Or something oh, like that dancing. With, uh, dancing oh, yeah, that's element. a great idea. Yeah. That's a great idea. Easter egg there. You know, I have been in organizations that are too outwardly focused. And what I mean by that is obsessed with competition. What are these people doing? We're not doing enough in that space. And I find that that usually causes a market to regress to the mean if you're not careful. Great competition is what we need. Like I'm a big believer that that creates the right types of constraints and motivations in organizations to get really, really innovative. But for us, what I've loved since joining SailPoint is just there is this constant drumbeat of we can't rest on our laurels. We just can't rest on our laurels. There are people catching up to us. We can't just keep going in a trajectory because we're headed that way. We have to think about how we leapfrog and reform things. And um, that's just really built into the DNA of SailPoint is that we, you know, I, I came in at a time where they were really trying to cross across the chasm and the SaaS part of the organization between we built up, you know, became a giant in the space, helped shape, you know, the compliance and governance space on the backs of Identity IQ, which is still IQ. a great product. And then figuring out, all right, SaaS is seeming to become a, a bigger and bigger ask and just the adoption rates were going at a really fast pace. What that opened up for us is brand new types of technologies and the big hyperscalers and cloud providers. and. So for us, I think if we set the right goals, 
and have smart constraints around our teams and then hire and bring in disciplined people that think with that kind of innovative engine, it goes a long way. We also just have practices like this year at Navigate, uh, two of the four I, like big launches that we had came out of an internal, we called it an innovation workshop and it was like a Shark Tank level months long innovation uh, program that we built where anybody could submit from across the organization. And it wasn't like a hackathon where it was a couple days. It was, they pitched into the C-suite of the organization, leadership selected the ideas, they got to formulate a team, they got executive coaches from our organization. And ultimately the, the prize was cash. And then you got on the roadmap of the R&D roadmap. And it was supposed to be one, but they liked two so much that we did two of them. And that was AI automated application onboarding and machine identity security. And they did insane research and they had data scientists on the team. And so we just try and weave it into the fabric too of how we, um, you know, innovation is not just for the R&D teams. It comes from everybody, like SEs in the field and sales folks. And we had uh, UX research driving one of the projects that was super powerful. So it's in the DNA at SailPoint. And that, that's what I love about it. It just keeps, uh, I think it keeps driving the right sort of outcomes when we have those incentives. How do we know if you're doing a good job? Sure. The people that, how do you know if the people that are working for you are doing a good job? Yeah. So we do, we do a couple of things here. Um, you know, you could say revenue, I guess, you know, <laughs> start there. Uh, for me, I, I, I go deeper and I think about one, we pay very close attention to just the retention of our customers. So if the customers we have, are we treating them well? Are we getting the, the right types of value so that they stay with us? So the longevity of those customer cohorts is really important and that retention rate, we watch really closely to understand, hey, what's well, what's going on with our customers that we need to change? So that's one and that can break down into having, we use objectives and key results, OKRs, and each of our teams have specific results they're trying to drive. So for the workflows team, it's about depth and breadth of workflows and they have a target that they're going after to see, can we get two thirds of enabled customers to have three or more of these workflows in production. And if they're not measuring to that, then we ask the question, we interrogate the goal. Was that the right goal? Was it the right thing? What other you know interferences are in the way that may have prevented it? But I asked each of my leaders create those with their teams and we measure them that way. And if you think about user experience design, it's part of the bigger picture, but we, we even do what's called UMUX Lite, which is like a customer satisfaction score in the application. So we can see by part of the app, we pop up and ask you know, four simple questions to a customer. It's kind of like NPS, net promoter score, but it's more geared toward user experience. Uh, and that gives a signal. It's like a constant heartbeat for different designers in the application of how easy it is to use, if customers are struggling with certain things. And so these are all different signals that we, we use to just hold ourselves accountable and make sure we're doing the right things. So I've always wondered, you get those pop-ups like, Oh, we what was this thing and what happened? Like, take, take me through a little bit just behind the scenes. Okay, so I answer those questions, then what? Yeah. So an example here would be, I'll just keep extending this, this workflows team example, which is a low code, no code, drag and drop experience for building identity automations um, in our platform. And there's a lot in that. You can say low code, right? It sounds great. But for someone that codes, they might just rather code it. Um, for someone that's new to the platform, you've got to have these menus and different descriptions and how you drag and coloration and hierarchy. And there's a lot to it. Um, we ended up using this UMAX score to understand how effective is it? How are customers liking this? And our teams were setting goals. They were setting quarterly goals on, can we drive this up? How satisfied are our users from you know one to five? And can we drive them up from three? When we get that pulse coming in, ultimately what those signals are giving us is it's a population of customers to then go dive deeper, saying when they're trying to use it, where are they falling down? Can we schedule a research call with them to actually chat with them and understand what would what would make a change? So we're we're mapping research techniques, quantitative and qualitative, and kind of using different tools in the in the toolbox to get better signal about what we're doing. It's definitely not just uh, going into the ether. So do you find? So here's my my perspective on this, right? I see a pop-up I hate my pop -ups feedback, so right? Much. First of all, there's that. Yeah. But I tend to only provide negative feedback. Sure. 
Do you find the same from, you know? You got to try and control for the negativity bias. Mm -hmm. um, and so if at all, we'll get to the like cultural anthropology, right? I get back to human biases and, uh, you know, thinking fast, thinking slow type methods here. Getting a baseline is really important. So even if it's going to be skewed to the negative, if you're getting a baseline and you know you have population bias based upon their negativity, that's okay. And I'm of the opinion that I've got to balance out with quantitative scoring success for my team so that they're motivated, right? To see like, hey, look at all these great things customers are saying that will speak on our behalf and look at all these massive impacts and like ROI they're getting in the organization. But I want bad news to be behind a megaphone, honestly, internally. And that's an old Bill Gates thing when he was seen as like a tyrant. That he was like, I don't wanna hear good news. I wanna hear bad news because it makes us better. So I've gotta have the types of systems and incentives and motivations to where that's not demoralizing, but it actually helps our team realize like, gosh, we're helping so many people and there's still a lot of low hanging fruit to really supercharge uh, sale point. All right, let me, let me put you on the spot here and I don't want you to name Please. and shame anything, but <laughs> what is the most critical or negative feedback that you've seen? Mm. Does that have to be current job or can it be prior? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Whichever one you want to go with, but like, what's the what's the like? Ooh, that really cut me to the core, and that hurt me. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. I'm gonna give you two. Um, you know, used to being in the consumer space, there's app store reviews, so it's not just for you, but people can see it, mm -hmm. and it ends up on kind of like public, public square type space. Um, and that is both one of the benefits of getting to work on applications that have had that much impact when they're that broad, right? They mean something to people. We changed, this is like going to seem humorous, but we changed how we visualize data about uh, running statistics. So this is an Under Armour. This is an Under Armour uh, uh, product that we did. And it, we did a long running research process. We did a lot of prototyping on it. Sometimes you still get it wrong. But I had someone write a review that said, and they obviously knew about software because they said, whatever product manager is responsible for this, I hope X happens to their family. And it was just, you know, deep trolling mm. that was <laughs> hurtful. <laughs> but I use that today with my team to kind of like put into context. Internet culture, right? You got to learn to shake it off. You got to find the things that actually serve you and are meaningful from customers. And we don't have that, those problems today at, at SailPoint of that level, but we we have had. This is a this is a great one that I, I actually really appreciate. I just talked to this customer yesterday's uh, on our customer advisory board now, but we have a, a forum where our customers are able to submit ideas and it's voted upon. And it helps us kind of get signal for hey, how impactful is this going to be? Um, and there was someone that said something to the tune of, "I have a toddler older than this idea." that had been out there for a while um and it's now like a it's it's a it's a motivator in our team today and certainly we you know i have to remind my team like we are humans and those things are going to be hurtful um and i think the mass majority of our customers in the ecosystem they're so kind but these are really impactful products that are you know people's careers and when they get blocked and there's issues that they have to overcome, we have to we take it really seriously. And I think that's just so important for my role and my team is to recognize like these are people's gigs and livelihoods that we got to help them get over the hump. And yes, we can't solve it the exact way all the time, but um, yeah, I certainly lose sleep over it. You know? Yeah. Well, you know you've made it when you have haters. So yeah. Jeff and <laughs> Jeff and I are like we're. We're hoping to get haters. Someday. Trying to get the haters. Yeah, <laughs> we're, to get the haters we're working going. on the list. Um, and I'm not putting that out there for anybody. To... <laughs> yeah, please don't. Not an don't invitation. Not an Thank invitation. You. Yeah, so uh, very thoughtful, that whole line on the product management. And it kind of leads into things. Um, one of the things you mentioned was that you're creating a roadmap. Yeah. I think that's kind of the outcome or the 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 big deliverable, it sounds like, from your role. Right. And it really makes a big impact here at the annual conference. 
And I'm kind of wondering if you could break down some of the highlights of that roadmap, what was announced during the, the session so far, or what's yeah. going to be announced. Obviously, this recording will go out after that. Um, but yeah, could you kind of give us some of the, the key points? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about, you know, I'll, I'll often say product is a, a what have you done for me lately type of gig. I will say this year a lot right now, and what I mean is 2025, because I'm just, like my head is already in 2025. But talking about just celebrating all this massive innovation that we're releasing today and uh, this week at Navigate, a couple of big ones that um, we've been in, been in the works for a long time. And first off is this work we were kind of chatting about in privileged task automation, which is this just industry shifting look at how you think about privileged tasks in your organization. There is a traditional way to think about it where privilege is a very small subset of activities that need to be faulted and recorded. And as we started to just uh, talk with customers, kind of pull on those threads, we realized privilege is a spectrum and SailPoint is really uniquely positioned to solve for some of these use cases because our customers invest so heavily in the connectivity layer to connect to you know, hundreds, thousands of applications that have privilege throughout it. And this was you know, the combination of an acquisition we made last year and then built on top of our Atlas platform and our workflows engine. But what we found is that you can automate what were previously highly repetitive tasks that took a human to go check out credentials to do it and actually go and re reperform these tasks over and over again. So you've got the human fallibility layer in there, and we could just take human out of that, that whole process, automate it on top of this trusted platform, and even have interactive capabilities where if you need to, for the example of like creating group membership, we've had customers have that have told us about pretty dire changes where a change was made to a group or a deletion in a group, and it wasn't actually behind privilege that caused this like massive outage of access across the organization. I was talking to someone today that like 80% of individuals lost access to Wi-Fi. And I was like, ah, that doesn't sound very good. That sounds like a real nightmare for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. A lot of people will react uh, viscerally to that one. But this privileged tax automated automation project or product is one we're really excited about. It is just a, a smart new look at how you leverage automation, how you take these repetitive tasks that are highly risky and do it in a way that's built core to our platform, gets assigned out as an entitlement. So it's got all these access controls already built in and lifecycle management around it. And you could do things like log into servers, start services. Uh, we talked about AD group management and what that looks like in our ecosystem on top of privilege task automation. We're just, we're really thrilled at the feedback we're getting from customers since it Before you go on with the rest of the roadmap, kind of pick on this one a little bit. So privilege yeah, yeah. task automation feels to me like it's the biggest innovation Management of AD security groups is like a sub bullet to <laughs> yeah. that. But to me, that's like, yeah, that's a big thing that organizations have been wanting. They yeah. had to solve it. And the question is, why now? Yeah. So for us, um, maybe back to even just this like product methodology, we're always looking at what are our competencies? Uh, customers want us to solve a lot of things um, and we can do anything, just not everything. And in that space, we started seeing, hey, there's, there's a lot to group in AD hygiene. And is Microsoft gonna be providing new tools that make this easier? Or there's a very pretty well-defined niche space out there in group management and kind of uh, data hygiene, transform, cleaning products. And as an open platform, we were thinking, well, integrations are going to work really well here. It's what we're built to do. We're great at for customers that want to build their own version of this and have a workflow around it and then integrate it in. We, we support that and have for a while. But uh, we just kept getting more and more signal for our customers on, hey, here are these really like security risks and massive productivity impacts happening with group changes. And the light bulb went off for us when we started embarking on this privileged task automation of, man, this is a privileged task that you want to be able to assign to a very small subset in some cases to take those actions. And do they even need to do it? Do they even need to actually sign in to AD, go create that? We can do this in a way that 
Um, most of it is automated. We can have overlays to ensure that naming schemas are met in the interactive forms as part of that task when it's launched. Uh, so it just all started to come together for us where we realized customers are, are still not being met where they want to be met on this. And we can solve this. Started to make more sense for us to make sure that, um, you know, there's so much downstream of if groups are coming in and uh, they're they're not coming in in a way that it's easy to understand relationships on or if a workflow is disrupted that some's happening outside of our identity security cloud product, uh, then there's just this gap that they have to go to some other team in the organization. So as we looked at productivity and this new opportunity, it made a lot of sense for us to, to put an offering out there. Jeff and I have been in this space for 20 years and I say that the, the idea was that IGA's role is to put people in and out of groups. It's something else to create the groups. But yeah. I think the lane is widening, right? So yeah, it wasn't I agree. strictly in the lane of IGA before, but I feel like there's some flexibility there. Certainly when you look at like the IDPs of the world, they're now saying we have IGA, we have the ability to yeah. attest or recertify people in our directory, which to me is very different than attesting to a correlated account that's co actually coming from the applications. It's the spectrum like you talked about. Yeah. It's, does it have value? Well, sure it has value versus, certainly versus doing nothing. Sure. It's way better than that, but is it all the way at the other end of the spectrum where you're actually certifying what's in the application? So, right. sorry, I went down a rabbit hole there. No. But I do think, you know, is that right that you look at it as the lane is, Kind of expanding. I think that's a. I think it's a great way to put it. For if we think about our customers, identity teams, and even just the CISO or CIOs organizations, looks a little different in various enterprises. But the lanes widening, and also due to just the continuing evolution of security threats and vectors. The, I, I like to call them the synapses in organization. Like those, we need new synapses between DevSecOps, between the identity team, between the HR organization, and what used to just be focused on productivity or compliance. If you don't have that identity context throughout every layer, then you're going to struggle when uh, downstream negative impacts happen, how you go upstream and fix it. And this is one of those places for us where we saw it maybe used to be outside of the identity team's purview, but they're finding that a workflow that is more important for them to achieve automation or to decentralize application onboarding so they can speed up and make it easier around some standards. There was this gap between, oh, we need to create a group and then it's got to get you know aggregated in and correlated. So that's time that I got to shift off task. And we looked at it in a new way to realize this makes complete sense for us to to solve and uh, to, I think, many of our customers going, uh, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah and with, with security group management, I think if you don't look at it very deeply, you just say, okay, it's just a sure. tiny little feature, but I've worked with so many organizations that don't have a tool that they just go directly into Active Directory users and yeah. computers, create groups, fill in the information that they feel is required. Yep. And name, you name it some weird IT name that nobody knows what that means. And exactly. The, the and proliferation of that downstream is it's wild. The you signal have, you lose. You don't have big. all the governance around, um, you know, required fields like who's the owner? Yeah. What's the purpose of the group? Things like that. Um, and so it's vitally important. So organizations that don't have a tool to guide all those things end up with group sprawl. Yeah. They end up with a group, a bunch of groups that they don't even know what what the original intent was for the group. Right. So yeah. I think it's very important. What are some of the other areas that you're announcing this week? Yeah, it's pretty uh, you know adjacent to that. Uh, we've invested in a new product called Machine Identity Security, which is you know in a, in a similar space. We started seeing just the this maturity curve out there in customers on how they enable the creation of new service accounts or new RPAs in their environment was pretty unsophisticated. There are a lot of customers that have them in Excel spreadsheets still today. It's not a single repository. They don't can't even visualize how big the surface area is of automated machine accounts or identities taking actions in the ecosystem. 
all the way up to pretty sophisticated organizations that have a single repository for repository for it. They've got some good access controls, wanting to be able to take it to the next step and actually like pay these things down, use a lot of the AI capabilities we have on outlier detection and activity to make it sharper and pay down that risk profile while not inhibiting the productivity they've created for their developer organizations. So we're, we're pumped about this one. I mean, just the, the energy around the space, Super it's been important. interesting to watch because especially in the venture capital space, I feel like I kind of have a joke with my team that every week I'd wake up to a new company and machine raising $60 million. And of course my team would be like, okay, can we get more funding in this space? <laughs> Which and then um, you remind them you're not a venture capital. <laughs> and I was like, we, yeah, exactly. But you know, we've we've invested really intelligently here. Where you know the same same team that focuses on our accounts and our identities team has been working on over the past year uncorrelated account detection and native change detection from external systems. And our this came out of that innovation workshop I talked about earlier, where we had a data scientist look at our whole ecosystem and understand how big the problem was with machine accounts out there that had no owners that were difficult to correlate. And so we've made an automated discovery mechanism for machine identities across our entire connectivity fabric, and it's built right into the platform with all out-of-the-box access controls that you want to have. And then just bespoke changes that we needed to make in the identity model with attributes and ownership kind of fall through and life cycle that you'd want to have that's slightly changed for a human to a machine. And we think this is going to be a, a, just a, a big unlock for customers and to kind of turn down the, the risk and kind of heart rate for some CISOs who I'll ask, I'll talk with, yeah, I was talking with a financial institution that I was working with her CISO and I said, I'm sure y'all y'all are pretty sophisticated in this space. And she just smiled at me and she goes, I want to know more about this product mm -hmm. because I'm not sure how many of these identities we even have in our ecosystem. And it just goes to show you, they're a really secure identity security company and their program is. But back to that lane widening concept from human into non-employee and third party is something we went into big over the past year and then in machine. We think those are, you know, comprise this huge surface area that we understand really well and are excited to help customers uh, just discover and manage a lot more effectively. Okay, final question. Yeah. And it wouldn't be an episode of our podcast if we didn't really get into AI just a little bit. Sure. But I want to hear more of a philosophical answer of this is, yeah. where do you see AI taking the IGA space specifically, right? Yeah. So at any governance administration, this is sort of what Gartner has coined you know, this product set at, or the set of capabilities as, yeah. where is AI going to take that? Yeah. So it's a great question. We, you know, as part, part of our launch here, you may have seen it in the keynote, we, we have been working on this agentic AI solution that's currently in beta. We're just, honestly, I'm just kind of staggered by what the team has done here. I promise I'll get to the philosophical part here. That is my, that's my favorite place to be, frankly. But what we've done is, you know, we really have been just methodically building out our ML architecture over the past, you know, five years or so, where we've got, we thought about it from the ground up. One thing we think is going to be increasingly important is the privacy as it relates to AI. What data does it have access to? Who has the right to see that data? It's crazy how quickly that can get out of control when generative AI and LLMs are unleashed on data. And we've seen that even with internal companies creating their own LLMs and agents to do certain things for lookups, et cetera. So for us, we're just really proud of where we came from, like leaning on this deep expertise in you know, the identity space and privacy and security for how we thought about exactly how we build our AI architecture. I think that's going to be really important, increasingly important as we go forward. Um, you know, there's a lot of fear that comes out of when you even just see our solution. It can, it's trained on the documentation. It can teach you how to use the application. Hey, what is, how do I manage machines? Uh, which of my identities are the riskiest ones? What should I do with those? It can do maturity guide on risk levels for you. It can generate workflows, it can generate certifications. It's really powerful. But what we think is going to be most important for us is staying really zeroed in on that refinement. 
if you've heard in like the LLM space of like rags of how you actually refine data and actually make purpose built AI, I'm just a real believer that it's going to be this big productivity boosters, but in the right zones. I am less, I'm very bullish, less fearful than a lot of people are on what they think AI is going to do in this space. I think what it's going to enable us to do more than anything else is be less fearful about the proliferation of accounts and access into really fine needles in a haystack fast. I think about some of those real prominent examples of AI at its best with like mach uh, machine imaging technology in like cancer screening. When you compare it to like radiologists looking at certain images versus another and just finding anomalous things that are very hard for the human eye to find. You can have great principles and policies and build all those out. And we've created AI tools along the way. App onboarding, entitlement descriptions with Gen AI, access modeling, outlier detection, and recommendations, and really trying to close that loop. We think that's really important. But I keep just coming back to, I think it's going to remove a ton of friction and start to highlight key areas where you're not having to make these massive certification decisions constantly. You're not having to spend nearly as much time on access models because you're just focused on the external, on the really those outliers and high risk zones. And you're going to get a lot of productivity boosts along the way where you can train people faster. Or you can, I, I, I'm definitely cognizant of this notion of, is AI going to replace people's jobs? And I, th I have young kids. I'm constantly thinking like, what are they going to do if this has the worst case scenario? And I just don't see it happening. I see more than anything else in our space. It's a great microcosm. You got teams that are strapped. They are having trouble getting enough people in the door to focus on these massive problems. And right now, with solutions like this, you can help train people faster. You can get people that aren't in the app every day to use it quickly. So it just becomes that really like uh, that really well informed guide and teacher along the way. I'm going to mention two concerns that I have. Yeah, I, AI with IGA. So first is if AI is making decisions on who gets access to what. Yep. And you can't explain how that decision was made. In other yep. words, AI decided. We don't know why. That's that goes against what has Principles. been the, the, it goes against the main principle of IGA, right? Yeah. So the second one is how do you secure it? So to make sure that only the right people can ask certain questions or get certain data yeah. in the response or in a software as a service that now the AI is smart enough to know what's happening across multiple customers and somehow yeah. someone can engineer it to get information that's uh, on a competitor. For example, so those sure. are my my two biggest yeah, concerns, concerns with AI. Let me tag on that one. What if it does the wrong thing? Yeah, that's the biggest thing. I think from a security perspective is, can we trust the AI to get it one hundred percent of the time right? Right. Yeah, I think the classic example of this is like just autonomous driving too. If you think about, uh, people are just so terrified of the use case of what if mm -hmm. the Who's, who's liable in those circumstances where something goes wrong? Is it the car? Is it the manufacturer? Is it the software? The owner. <laughs> and, you know, if you really think about it, the data set there is really compelling when you compare it to distracted driving and how many people are out there that you see at a stoplight, like, looking at their phones. And But at the end of the day, we trust humanity. We trust humans. And I, I things that I'm not concerned about, back to the design not only at the architecture from the ground up of how we how we think about housing data, that it's only going to be used in the cases where it's needed for that customer's data alone, if it's not public or sensitive data. Um, that's paramount for us. We can't do that. That is the that is the sale point brand, right? Like doing it with integrity and impact the right way. And that's how we're going to build this and how we started from the very first. But also the like how you grant access we are what do we do well we govern access to things so creating capabilities and if i think philosophically where we're going to need to play in this space is exactly there this is no different than you know lower level machines human access what you should be able to access we got to be able to empower that that's paramount 
Now, I think the your first your first concern remind me what it was. It was, was if we can't explain why AI oh, made yeah. the decision on. So there's a, uh, a, a, a philosophy set of principles out there. It's called explainable AI, and really what this is is just imagine in an identity solution today. If you didn't emit an audit event, you wouldn't know what the what the team did to change said thing, right? Same goes for AI. We've got a, the black box can't be a black box. It's got to be open. You have to have explainable AI, which is here's the set of decisions. Because what's great about this is a kind of Petri dish. And I say this and identity security for AI at large is we have to exceed the expectations of risk and compliance. And if we're doing that, then that gives us really good signal of where we can continue to grow it uh, just in intelligent, methodical, and sensitive ways. Okay. Your handlers are getting restless, so... We're going to wrap it up here. <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> um, thank you so much for spending time with us. Yeah, it's been really fun. It's been a really interesting conversation. And I'm, I'm, I'm very bullish on the AI stuff. So anytime I see, I, I'm always naturally curious about it. And I think it's going to be a great differentiator for a lot of folks yeah. in the space. So Me too. thank you so much for taking time. Um, we're going to have a link to your LinkedIn profile in our show notes. Sounds so great. people can connect and hopefully, you know, send nice things, maybe dancing elephants or <laughs> dancing other things elephants. like that. No, yeah, no yeah can't wait. <laughs> right. Um, and that's it. So we're on the web, idacpodcast.com. We're on YouTube, idacpodcast.tv. Like and subscribe helps us get great guests. And yeah, we'll leave it there. Thanks everyone for watching and or listening. And we'll talk with everyone in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.